In this podcast, Professor Richard Griffiths looks at an ancient wreck discovered in the Java Sea in the 1990s, which offers us a rare glimpse into the trade and shipping along the Maritime Silk Road 10 centuries ago. How was the discovery made? Who were the traders? And what did they carry? Where did they come from? And where were they going? And what terrible secret lay buried below the surface? Listen now to the fate of the Intan wreck. Hi there. In the early 1990s, some fishermen fishing near the Intan oil field in the Java Sea, about 150 kilometers north of Jakarta, discovered shards of earthenware in their nets. As news of the finds began to spread, it attracted unlicensed treasure hunters. The gang recovered several hundred pieces of ceramics and metal objects before the authorities tracked them down and arrested them. In 1997, a local salvage company was granted a license to excavate the site. But as the richness of the wreck became transparent, the government hired in Maritime Explorations, directed by Mike Flecker, to oversee the operation. You can see Mike here in the picture on the left, on the deck of the ship, logging tin ingots. And on the right, you've got a picture of the whole team, minus Dan Burton, the photographer. Here are Mike's own words describing the start of his adventure and the nature of the finds. There was not much to see on the seabed. The gently undulating sand was punctuated here and there with encrusted stoneware fragments. The odd flash of green on corroded copper, an intact basin, and the occasional granite grindstone. Far more impressive were the dozens of blue-spotted stingrays that burst forth from the sand only metres from my mask, scattering in all directions as I swam over the wreck remains. The wreck site was a diver's delight. 27 metres deep, clear waters and low currents allowed us to use a simple surface-supplied hooker diving system. A rope grid was set up over the entire site to ensure that it was excavated systematically in order to record the location of all recovered artefacts. Water dredges were used to gently suck away the layer of sand and silt that hid the ancient cargo from view. Nothing prepared us for the diversity and the extraordinary archaeological significance of the cargo we uncovered. The artefacts from this one shipwreck provide graphic evidence of great craftsmanship, advanced technology, religious fervour, cross-cultural influences and aggressive international trade. The shipwreck is unique, a locally made vessel trading between Sumatra and Java, between the powerful empire of Sri Vijaya and the Javanese state of Mataram over a thousand years ago. She carried bronzes cast in Sumatra, yet showing strong Buddhist and Hindu influences of India. She carried beautiful ceramics, bronze mirrors and silver ingots from China. She carried intricate fine pasteware candies and bottles from Thailand. She carried tin from the Malay Peninsula and she carried glass and pottery from the Middle East. It's hard to conceive that so much cultural and commercial interaction between the lands of the Indian Ocean and the China Sea could be so vividly displayed in the cargo of this one small ship. Well, that was Mike in his own words describing what he found. So let's turn our attention now to the wreck itself and try to answer the following questions. What kind of ship was it? What was the main cargo? Who were the traders? What route was it taking? And what was the secret waiting discovery? Okay, what kind of ship was it? Well, to be honest, not much of the ship itself remained. But some fragments of planking were recovered, which pointed to the fact that the planks had been pegged together using wooden dowels. Now, this is a technique that was common in South and Southeast Asia, but totally unknown in China at the time. Chinese ships were constructed using hundreds of iron nails, but there were no trace of nails found anywhere near the wreck site. 
Moreover, the timber found was typical of a type found locally, so it seems reasonable to assume that it was of Indonesian origin and carried an Indonesian crew. Judging from the distribution of the cargo, it was 30 metres long and about 10 metres wide. The carbon dating of the wood and ceramics and the dates found on the coins, which was 918 CE, pointed to the wreck being from the early or mid-10th century. Unfortunately, we have no pictorial representation of such a craft. Possibly the closest we can get is a carving from the ancient site of Barabadur in central Java. But the ship shown here is far smaller than the Intan wreck, and the lug lash cargo ships like the Intan wreck would never have had an outrigger like the one you can see here in the picture. So, what was the main cargo? Well, we've heard the overview of described, described by Mike, but let's return to some of the items in more detail. The largest item in both terms of weight and volume were the ceramics. The wreck expedition recovered over 7,300 pieces of ceramic from the site. Two thirds of these were brown green glazed pots made in China. There was also a variety of finely decorated white pieces. And not all of the ceramics were made in China. There were hundreds of fine white paste bottles and cadis from southern Thailand. And pieces of what had originally been large blue-green glazed jars from the Middle East. The combined weight of the ceramics on board the ship would have been around three tons. The ship was also carrying two tons of tin ingots. Just under 800 were recovered by the team, but the original number was probably closer to 1,000. The bars were in different sizes, but they were all shaped like a truncated pyramid, and many were incised with a cross for identification. And these probably originated from where is now North Malaysia. The ship also carried a similar weight of bronze ingots, some of which were in the shape of domes, but others were in the shape of standard bars of just over three kilograms. So the total amount of those metal objects then would have been another four tons. Now the ship may also have carried textiles and various spices and foodstuffs, but most of these deteriorated over time. The team did find thousands of candle nuts from Sumatra, um, used for cooks to make a curry-like sauce and so well preserved were they that the kernels smelt almost as fresh as when they'd been harvested. The most expensive item on board were the silver ingots. There were 97 of these, all originating from Chinese mines and all in the form of bars of a standard 1.85 kilograms. Many of them were incised with Chinese characters. and For some, the wrapping was still intact. The wrapping was in the form of tin sheets of silver, and on some of them the writing could still be seen. They showed that they'd originally been payment of a salt tax and collected by a local government office. Now 185 grams of silver with a high degree of purity is worth a great deal, certainly more than several percent of the government's revenues, and it was probably on its way to be converted into coin in Java. But how did it leave China in the first place? Was it a payment for some large cargo? For example, the aromatics that were very popular at the time. Or was it simply smuggled out of the country? Well, we'll probably never know. So let's turn now to who the traders were. Now, the first question we need to ask is whether we should imagine that they were few in number and each of them owned a large part of the total cargo or whether there were many small traders, each dealing with a personally selected small share of the cargo. But how can we possibly answer that question? Well, we have to make an assumption. The answer is that if the ownership of the cargo were easily identified, it would be rational to load the ship in such a way as to make sure of its optimal performance and safety. In that case, the heavier goods would have been stacked first along the length of the vessel, or at either end, in order to ensure the vessel's stability, and lighter goods would have been stacked above. 
If, on the other hand, there were many smaller consignments, each merchant would want to have his own cargo stored and labelled separately to, to identify his own property. So if we come back now to the Intan wreck, the distribution of metal ingots confirms this pattern, as though the brown were pots. But, for example, the 350 Chinese and Indonesian mirrors were found in two or three separate locations and in different mixtures, suggesting that these belonged to at least two merchants. And the rest of the pottery and glassware, although distributed over the wreck, was also in mixed concentrations. And all of this suggests that they formed separate consignments owned by separate merchants. In other words, peddler trade, small traders selling a carefully selected range of items. So, where did it come from and where was it going? Well, the answer to the character of the traders points to the answer to the route. The products on board the ship had come from the Middle East, the Malay Peninsula and southern China, but it's quite certain that the Intan vessel certainly never visited these lands itself. It's doubtful whether it even visited China because the tin from Malaysia was underneath the Chinese ceramics, although it would have been purchased after its visit to China. So you'd have to load and unload several thousand pots if you wanted to do it in that way. No, what had probably happened is that the Intan vessel had stopped off at one of the entrepot ports, a sort of rich emporium offering the products of the world, sort of one great giant wholesaler where deals could have been made for bulk goods and where a peddler could wander around and make his own personal selection that he thought would please his potential customers. The most probable contender is uh, Palambang, the capital of uh, Siri Javaya, that commanded the Malaccan Straits. And it's through this area that most of the ship's trading would have to pass. And it was clearly on its way to the island of Java. This is probably a regular route going back and forwards several times a year, except this time, of course, something went very badly wrong. So what was the terrible secret? During the excavation, more than 40 pieces of bone were discovered. Most of them were tie bones of femur, which suggests that as many as 20 people died on board the ship. But under normal circumstances, this seems unlikely. First of all, many of the ships had a smaller rescue boat behind them to rescue the crew and the most important passengers. And secondly, if such a boat were not available, one would expect the passengers to cling to some floating object in an effort to survive. They might drown, but their skeletons wouldn't be found together at the bottom of the sea inside the narrow search area of the wreck. So the answer is that these people drowned where they did because they couldn't move away. Now, since prisons are virtually unknown at this time, let alone the practice of moving prisoners around, the only answer is that they were part of the cargo. Among all the metal, fine glasswork, superb ceramics, this ship was trading in slaves. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Um, you can find all the details of the site evacuation discoveries here. The book is free online. The music was composed by Janet Zaddo, director of the Florence Youth Orchestra. The photographs of the excavation came from Mike Flecker's personal collection, and the two photographs of Mike and the team were taken by Dan Burton. You can find more podcasts on our website, as well as details of our projects and many other resources. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye.